Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to the Jazz and Heritage Foundation's offices, and thank you for being here at the Sync Up Conference, our first annual, so we're pleased that you could join us today. My name is Scott Ages. I'm Director of Programs and Marketing here at the Foundation, and um, one of the guilty parties for trying to get this thing happening. Most of you know, I'm sure, that um, this is the Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which is the nonprofit organization that for nearly 40 years now has been the owner of Jazz Fest and uses the proceeds from that incredible event for year-round activities in the areas of education, economic development, and cultural programming. And this event is part of our economic development uh, mission. Uh, we have education programming. Our, our most notable program is the Don Jamison Her Heritage School of Music, which is a free after-school program that teaches kids the basics of jazz performance and theory. We have numerous housing initiatives and grant programs and other things that we do in the areas of economic development. In culture, we do a lot of various programming throughout the year. We have a number of new festivals that we've started, free events like the Crescent City Blues and Barbecue Festival, Fiesta Latina, the Louisiana Cajun Zydeco Festival, and more. So there's been a lot of growth and activity in this organization in the past couple of years. So the Sync Up initiative is uh, part of our economic development mission. It's the result of a partnership with the state of Louisiana, a couple of different agencies from the state, the Department of Economic Development, as well as Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism, and uh, the Division of the Arts, and a number of other organizations that have contributed to make this happen. Um, it, it, the, the basic goal, as I said, is to connect Louisiana artists, nearly all of whom are completely independent, as you all know, and, and connect them with specifically two markets, the festival market for live performances and um, the film and TV market for licensing of music. Now, you may notice that I didn't really talk about distribution of, of recordings through the traditional sense because that is an area that is the industry is changing, but uh, one of our panelists today may be able to address some of that in more detail at, at the, because there has been a lot of success, which we're thrilled to say, especially as far as Louisiana is concerned. Um, today's topic is exporting Louisiana music. Next week, we have another session on Friday that is digi about digital technologies, especially in the aftermath of the MP3 revolution and how are other aspects of the industry, in addition to uh, consumer purchasing of MP3 files, how is digital technology changing the other sides of, of the business, like booking, touring, licensing, and so on. And then our final panel will be a week from today on the international festival market, so I hope you can come back for that. So today, um, we have a really great panel. Um, unfortunately, Michael Justens from the Handelsberg Concert Hall in Belgium had to cancel at the last minute. He wasn't able to make the trip. Um, but we do have a number of really great people, and I'm thrilled to welcome them. Um, we have Marion Leighton Levy, owner of Rounder Records. And as you know, they have been extremely active over the years in producing recordings by a number of great Louisiana artists. So they're probably the most active record label as, as far as uh, Louisiana is concerned. Mike Kappas, owner and founder of the Rosebud Agency, uh, which has booked over the years a number of very significant um, touring artists from Louisiana, uh, especially Beausoleil and Alan Toussaint and now Trombone Shorty as well. Dirty Dozen. Dirty Dozen, of course. Ira Podnos is the founder of the Ponderosa Stomp Music Festival, which not only has uh, produced a number of terrific events here in town, but has also taken that show on the road and has been very active in exporting Louisiana music that way. Mary Lou Kras from the Overture Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, right? And, and as a talent buyer, has been extremely active over the years in bringing a number of Louisiana artists up to that region and helping them uh, get on the road that way. And then, finally, is Ben Jaffe of Preservation Hall. You all know Ben. And with the Preservation Hall Jazz Band, has been instrumental in taking New Orleans music, especially, on the road to an international market. So what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is just start with some really basic questions and uh, just get each of you to uh, address them from your own perspective. And we're talking about exporting Louisiana music. Everybody here, I'm sure most of the folks in the, artist, in the audience are artists or um, operators of independent labels, am I right? So what folks here are interested in is, is developing the market, finding out where that market is, ex exploiting that market in a good way, 
to the, to the greatest extent possible. So let's just look at the market. What is the market for Louisiana music? From your perspective, is there a particular demographic that that the uh, that is a consumer of Louisiana music? Is it do they live in a particular place? Uh, each of you bring your own perspective to a Trump because either as sellers or as buyers, you're trying to either sell tickets to the people who are consumers of Louisiana music or sell CDs to the people who are consumers of Louisiana music or book Louisiana bands at events around the world. So can you just um, just kind of riff on the idea of, of the, the marketplace for Louisiana music. Mary, since you're here, why don't you start first? Sure. Um, I, I think, in fact, we have a uh, very good sort of um, very broad um, thumbnail, if you will, of uh, the consumer, um, the people who are interested in Louisiana music over at Jazz Festival. It's as broad as the people who buy tickets and come all the way to New Orleans from other parts of the country. So it's a very broad demographic, I think, um, <clears throat> in terms of um, record sales. Um, if you're talking sort of hard copy CDs, it's probably a somewhat older demographic, somewhat more male. Um, on the other hand, when you're talking downloads, and companies like ours, of course, have a whole new revenue stream from downloads online, then it's probably going to be the younger and more college age part of the market. So again, um, the nature of the artist that you're talking about comes into that as well. Um, obviously, older and more traditional forms in the purer sense of the word, it's probably going to be an older um, consumer. And uh, some of the newer and more experimental and eclectic ways of um, incorporating um, traditions, musical traditions from this part of the country will probably be younger. So it's a very broad range. That would be my answer. Mike? Well, I'd say that um, not just the New Orleans market, but any market for any artist is really all about positive awareness. Um, positive awareness to the consumer that they want to spend their time and their money, time and or their money, buying your CD or going to see your performance. And so New Orleans had an advantage, I guess, going back, it seems to me like in about the 80s in particular. Uh, New Orleans food, New Orleans music really got a big bump internationally and internationally, I think. And maybe that was uh, attributable to a degree to the popularity of the festival coming on, too, and people coming from all over the world to the festival, that really getting itself going at the time. And at that time, we took we started working with the Neville Brothers, and then later on, uh, the Dirty Dozen, and so on. And everywhere they'd go, people would have gumbo and everything for them, and it's, it's, not like they can make it here, but they all felt they were doing a wonderful thing for these artists. Mm -hmm. But uh, at any rate, um, now I think the buzz, the big buzz of New Orleans food and music is not what it was at the time. And there's still fans of New Orleans music in general, but I think, again, you have to get back to the individual artist and the awareness of the individual artist, regardless of where they're from. There's an advantage, especially maybe in Europe, other places like that where there's more of a novelty to having a New Orleans show with several New Orleans, New Orleans artists or something. But, but I think that uh, really it always boils down to the, the individual artist. Unless you're packaged, which is a wonderful thing Ponderosa Stomp is doing, is packaging. Um, but unless you're packaged like that, it does boil down to the individual awareness of the artist, which is, that's a whole other panel probably about building that. Like uh, a festival saying a New Orleans night, and we're going to have three or four artists from New Orleans, or in the case of Ponderosa Stomp, they put all these names together, which is a great way of, you know, people maybe don't know all of the artists, but they know some of them, or there's a big, it's more likely to get uh, space in the local newspaper, the music magazine, or whatever, about this uniqueness of all these different artists and the history of them and everything. There you go again with positive awareness. And then more people come out at the show, get educated, Spread the word. If, oh, I, if well, I could just say one more thing about what Mike was saying about positive awareness, too. Um, in terms of something that's almost impossible to sort of create in advance, but it is true that in the period that, Mike, uh, that um, a lot of New Orleans artists were starting to get national attention around the, was around the time of the movie The Big Easy. And at Rounder, we saw the same thing happen with the movie Oh Brother for bluegrass music. So that's the kind of intangible that sometimes happens that then brings a whole new wave of people, many of them superficial, they move on to the next thing, but many of them then choose to go deeper and go and um, support 
New Orleans or Louisiana artists wherever they can and the culture and so forth. But So those are the kinds of things that sometimes become huge um, kind of cultural phenomena that have to do with what we're talking about too, I think. Um, part of what we're talking about is, uh, in effect, branding. Because we're talking about Louisiana which and New Orleans, which comes with a, a certain brand of its own, but Marin, in your case, Rounder, has developed, and we should, I should have mentioned that you all just recently won a Grammy Award for Irma Thomas. So congratulations on that. So, speaking of exporting Louisiana music to a global market. Thank you, and long overdue for Irma. Indeed. She's, she's one of the greats. Um, but also, Ira, uh, similarly with Rounder, uh, it's been, it's, it, you're not just relying on the brand of New Orleans or Louisiana, you've developed a brand for Ponderosa, so as people may not be familiar with a rounder artist necessarily, but they see the name on the packaging, they have a, a trust factor that there, there's a d degree of quality there. Similarly with Ponderosa, if people, um, they may not know all the names of the artists that they see on, on the, the schedule, but they know that since it's been curated by you, that it's going to come with that authenticity and that, that level of quality. Now, but especially as, as far as Louisiana music is concerned, I'm curious, and I, I don't think I've ever had a chance to ask you this before, um, it, it seems that Ponderosa really emerged from a, a, a very deep source within your, your own personal taste and your love of, of certain sounds was, uh, but you've, you've always included artists from, from a variety of regions, from Memphis and from the other areas of the South. How does Louisiana versus Mississippi versus other areas play into your, um, your thinking when you're making talent selections? Well, I mean, the, the first of all, when we originally conceived the Ponderosa Stop, though we're based in New Orleans and we, and we love all Louisiana artists, the idea was that we took a regional approach and that basically a lot of the music that, you know, that American music really always developed in the South, blues, jazz, rhythm and blues, I mean, it all, country, bluegrass, you know, it was pretty much a lot of this was, you know, similar roots and where they're developed in the South. So the idea was, let's create a regional approach to this and viewing that, basically view this as let's, let's go and uh, basically get the people from the various regions to make it, the connect the dots in terms of like a secret history of rock and roll and that, there's all these people that you, you, you that played a role, but you never really knew. I mean, who knew who the studio musicians were that were playing behind Fat, Little Richard and, and Fats Domino in the studio and who was arranging it? Who was the guys who were backing Elvis and, and other people in Sam Phillips' son studios? Who were the people that cut all the records in L.A. that were session guys that were from New Orleans? So it was kind of like an interconnecting thing of saying, here's a map that you didn't know. And the other thing is, you didn't know that this artist worked with these people 50 years ago and they influence each other, but, you know, it kind of connects the dots. Uh, you know, the thing is, when we first started doing this, there was no master plan. It was just, let's go get people that are deserving artists out that just haven't played in years. I wanted to see with a few friends that, that uh, persuaded me to start doing this. I mean, there was no master plan. I'm an anesthesiologist. I wasn't trying to be in the record interest, music business. I was like trying to tell them no, and they kept saying, come on, book these, book these people. And I said, find me a place to go that we can do it. And we wound up at the Circle Bar, because I walked in, and I saw Hop Wilson on the jukebox next to a Captain Beefheart CD. I said, all right, we can do it here. <laughs> <laughs> they get it. So, so that's, you know, and by design, and the, I mean, we want, we stress, you know, because we love Louisiana music and we want to stress and get as much stuff out there as possible, unsung heroes. So you'll see everything from people that, you know, that played and cut records, uh, you know, for Excello. We, you know, we've had extensive Excello, you know, people that cut Excello. We've had people from, uh, you know, from Lake Charles area all the way to Shreveport and Louisiana Hayride stuff, but it just, you know, but we, we, we do broaden by going outside, but the key is we want it to be authentic, and the thing is that for me, if the, rec the record, has got, the performance has got to be able to stand in the merit of the records so and we heard the stuff, so if I don't, we don't believe in the record, then we don't want to hire the performer because we just don't have faith in it. Well, let me ask you one other thing. Now, in, uh, you, you started Ponderosa Stomp in New Orleans. It's a New Orleans event. Correct. After the hurricane, you uh, took it to Memphis for a year. Yes. Which was because of circumstances, of course, right, right. And not, as opposed to a desire to take the show we, on the road. We just didn't know what the infrastructure, we have, I mean, the thing is, Ponderosa Stomp staff is about two to three people at all times. 
<laughs> that can work on it mostly, and it's it's all. And I mean, we have a few more, and it's all it's mo it's all volunteer driven. So it's impossible when you work a full time job to try to you know to know what's going to happen. And we actually had called people in the you know, uh, airline executives and some hotel people and they said, look, we can't guarantee anything, so that was the decision to move it at that point. But also, I've been interested to notice over the past couple of years that you've taken, two years in a row now, you've taken a Ponderosa Stomp showcase to South by Southwest, the conference in Austin, Texas. You have now um, put um, a recording together, a compilation recording of different artists, <laughs> and you've started a foundation to go along with it. So as you go to these other events, when you go to South by Southwest, and, and in terms of my original question about the market <laughs> for this Roots music, um, and I don't want to limit it to Roots, we'll broaden it to exactly what Louisiana music consists of in a little while, but what are, what are, what's the reception that you're getting when you approach places and, and tell them about what you're doing? How do people perceive in the markets where they are what you're trying to do? You know, it's, we stumbled into the South by Southwest thing. We said if we want to do it, and then we, you know, we went there and they, we had a great review, and each year they want us to come back. I didn't want to go this year, and they begged me to come back. It just, it's, it's just really hard because it's just that on top of doing the stop, it's very hard. Um, in terms of marketability, uh, you know, it's just people are, you know, when I first started this, someone told me you'd be lucky to five 500 people in the whole world that would want to come to an event like mm -hmm. this. And next thing I know, we basically have been, you know, I, I got out of the blue, we got an offer to go to New York. It wasn't solicited. It just seems like people, there's a real interest in authentic music out there that people want to see, especially now because just everything's so processed. They want to see what can be real. The other part I think of the Lure of the Stomp is it's basically you're getting to see performers performing in a real concert setting, taking the music on its own merits instead of having it showcase as an oldies package where they can't feel like they can really show what they can do. And that, I think, is another thing that really lends itself to the credibility. In terms of, the, of, of who we market to, we just put it out there, and if people want to see something real authentic, they will come to it. And the broad appeal is we will have everybody from 20-year-old punk and 18-year-old kids and ripped T-shirts, punk rockers, to, to, to 70 and 80 to 75-year-old English record collectors coming over. It's all over the place, I would say. Traditionally, if I had to say an age group, it probably skews to about a 35 person in their mid 30s. But it's, it's, I mean, it's incredibly all over the place. I mean, you go up, and I'm sitting there in Austin. I've got kids that are in young punk bands coming up and talking to me about stuff. Next thing I know, I got, you know, it's just all over the market. Mary Lou, yeah. in your region and from in your travels, how do you perceive the market for Louisiana music? Well, first of all, for the market, uh, for, for us, um, the, the important thing is to educate, first and foremost, and to educate our audiences. And um, we have, just to give you a little information, we have a concert hall theater that I book that's 2,250 seats. We also have another theater in the same building that um, is my favorite, which is a 1929 the renovated theater that uh, seats 1,100 and then we have several other venues that can seat anywhere from four to 400 to 250 in different configurations. Um, we have a season that runs from uh, September through May of shows. And so one issue is to book these artists a year in advance. And uh, I'm going to use a, an example of Bonarama. And um, we had to contact them last June to book them for a show last March, this 08. Um, that means that while you're waiting for this show to happen, you're hoping that they're um, winning awards, they're doing Letterman, they're creating some chaos out there so that um, our 60,000 student body uh, on the other end of our campus, at, of our building where it's situated, um, has to understand who they are as well. Now we have a contingent, we have a pretty good group of people that attend New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival for years and years and, and, and so we have a base, but um, our audience is such that they'll be ordering their tickets next week. There's, there's subscribers, there's thousands of subscribers and they can order their tickets from May until August ahead of the public and they order in packages of either they can order five shows, seven shows or nine shows. Now, with me putting on Louisiana music, it allows me to add, if somebody's trying to get their five shows, they'll probably add Bonarama if they're buying Irvin Mayfield. Um, 
So, you know, we, we, we did the Urban Mayfield Orchestra this last year and um, probably had 1,900 people, 1,900 as a, a almost full. And um, Bonarama uh, came along then in March and uh, Urban was here in February and Bonarama came in March and so we had another audience there of people who had already experienced Louisiana music the month before. So yeah, they're gonna come in and buy a Bonarama ticket. That said, the Bonarama band, um, we needed a lot of different marketing tools to get people excited. You know, first of all, they didn't have any, a lot of people didn't even know who Bonarama was, okay? You gotta deal with that. And, um, but they had drop cards for us so we could hit the streets with these little cards so that they could download their music. Very important. They had, uh, they connected a street team with our students from their agency so they were able to hook up and send lots of materials and keep kids excited. The booking timing is such that if I booked Bonarama during spring break, I'd be screwed. So, um, so I, had to, I had to find the time when they're coming back, which they did. They were just back the week before. But then we had the NCAA tournament, and we were, you know, now I'm fighting with the, the, the student body of sports, you know. Um, you know, we have, we have the athletics in our city, so it's, it's you know, you're, you're constantly, you know, you got 70,000 people in a, in a venue down the street watching basketball, and I'm trying to get 1,200 to come to, you know, to a different show. So, you know, you, you got that, but I think, um, in general, our audience for, just for Bonarama alone, went from the student body, from 20-year-olds to 22-year-olds, all the way up to 60 and 70 year olds because they bought a subscription ticket back in May and they didn't have any idea what they were buying but they wanted to make sure that they could get their five shows so so we um, we do it that way and this year we have um, George Porter the PBS coming we have um, Neville's we have Dr. John so most likely those the same people buy the same tickets so, so you deal with some of the top tier artists the Neville brothers Dr. John and so mm -hmm. on and you also reach down into, into some of the you know the second and third how yeah you know, since you're the only talent buyer on yeah. the panel, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> <laughs> the second and third tier is the fun part, you right. know, because that, I put those guys in our Capitol Theater, and that's the best, that's the best theater. We also waive, you know, you know, we, we've got a $200 million building that, you know, is still, we're still getting the kinks out of it. We built it five years ago. It was an old civic center, it, and we had one donor that decided that he wanted to, um, preserved the Civic Center and he donated the, the funds to build this block sized building. So yeah, I mean. Uh, well, so my question is, um, as a talent buyer, can you just take us a little bit through your thought process as far as when you're when you're making talent selections, you're looking at your concert series. And I'm, I'm sure Mike is, is a, as an agent <laughs> wanting to sell you axes, perking up as well. <laughs> um, how do you, I mean, make, how do you weigh various considerations? I mean, does the fact that an artist is from Louisiana versus Mississippi versus Chicago, does, does, does that enter, enter your thought process? Do you have any motivation? I mean, I know you're a Jazz Fest regular, so you, I know you have a love for the music. Yeah. When you come down here, are you scouting bands? Or All you, the time. So yeah. d d tell us what you're looking well, for. Well, I, I definitely want to look for the Louisiana groups and, you know, the... the the, the third tier, as you call it, I don't know if that's really what I would think it's a third tier, but um, they, they are my absolute favorites. And, and again, I want to bring in the education portion of it because we want to develop these artists so that, uh, for instance, Bonarama came to play, we're going to bring them back now, they're going to do an educational piece with, you know, our, our top high school music students, they're going to come in early, they'll do, you know, so, so there's, there's that consideration. Um, longevity. Um, if I book an artist uh, for next year, are they going to be around uh, when the show start, you know, comes? So there's a credibility factor. Credibility. Um, I'm hoping that I'm going to read about them in the paper and read the awards, and I'm hoping that they're going to just keep building on what they have and uh, leading up to the show that I'm booking for. Um, so, yeah, the credibility, the, the longevity. The so a brand new act that just got together and doesn't have much of a track record, what's you, and they come up and hit you. I'll, I'll watch them for in the next year. I'll watch them, and I will see what's going on for next year. 
And then if you are dealing with a band that doesn't have, let's say, much of a national or international profile, you talked about some of the ways that you try to educate mm -hmm. the audience about who they are. Well, we have another sweet little thing. We have um, opportunities to do free programming once a month in this huge lobby that we hold 450 people at. So we, we, we call it Overture After Work. It's free. It's cheap beer, you know, right. everything, food. And um, that's the place where I would probably, you know, I have a different level of pay, of course, but I'm saying to the artist, look, if you come up and do this Overture After Work, We'll sell your CDs, we'll get your name out there. You're two hours from Chicago, you're an hour and a half from Milwaukee. You know, maybe you can, you know, we can do some, some block booking for you and help you out in that, in that respect. That's always a plus. And, um, and so a Thursday night from five to seven is a sweet little gig for somebody who doesn't, you know, is just, te you know, we're just teaching our audience. Right. So I, I am always, my angle is, I think the artist is awesome. I don't care what level they're at. We just need to educate our audience to get them excited to want to see them again and again and again. And so the free stuff, they can come in, you know, we pay a certain level for that group and they, you know, they get a room for the night. They can get up and go to another show the next day. We let them keep all their, their fees that they sell at the show. So, um, and we educate the people. And when, whether, when you're booking an artist from Louisiana, mm -hmm. whether it's at a Neville Brothers level, mm -hmm. or a Bonarama level, or, or even deeper into the talent pool, how much of your marketing effort calls attention to the fact that these artists are from New Orleans or from Louisiana? Do you use that in your, in your promo? Oh yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, Bonarama, we, we, needed, to, um, we needed about $4,000 in marketing fees, you know, in marketing. And that, and that covered, you know, a lot of materials, print materials, all kinds of things. But then we have a great relationship with our media. And, you know, they, they got splashed on the front page of the lifestyle section probably three times throughout the year before they even came. They, you know, lucky they went to Letterman. So then we had that video on our website. So we, you know, so that's, that's one way of and doing it. In many ways, a quintessential New Orleans band. So everywhere they go, the, uh, the subject of New Orleans is going to come up. So that Absolutely. plays into it. All right, all right, I'm done picking on you for the moment. That's all right, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> ben, you bring so many different perspectives to this, I'm not even sure where to start. Um, Preservation Hall as a club is an institution that is known around the world. People from all over, the, in, I've uh, actually, over the years I've thought of it, you, you're in a really interesting situation because you know exactly who your audience is because they come to you physically. They come to town, they come through your door, you, you meet them face to face and you have a venue where they can go. In terms of CD sales, I, 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 I guess it's still true. I know for many years it was true that the, um, when, we still, when we used to have a towered record shop uh, on Decatur Street, um, always the number one seller was Preservation Hall Jazz Band. In fact, I used to uh, say, not really jokingly to a lot of people, that the only band in New Orleans that does well enough to own its own tour bus is the Preservation Hall. I don't know if you guys still have the bus. Uh, Katrina's got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the touring band, you go all around the world, people know who you are, you are ambassadors for New Orleans, you represent New Orleans everywhere you go, there's New Orleans written all over everything that you do, and now of course with your own record label, you are a distributor and a, a marketer of recordings, some of which are very traditional, some of which are completely non-traditional, so... Mm -hmm. Through all of that, and in your travels around the world as a representative of New Orleans with you know, deep family roots and having created an institution here, started by your parents, what, what do you perceive the market to be globally for, um, for Louisiana music in whatever way you choose to characterize it? I, I think the market is, is, is gigantic. Uh, you, there's, I mean, if... There's only a couple categories of music. There's classical, there's jazz, there's... I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking about the way that a booker thinks about, about what they're booking for a season, they need a, a world music act, they need a dance act, they need, you know, a juggler, a magician, and then they need a New Orleans band. And uh, there's no other city that can claim that, that says, that can say that we have our own category. You can go into a record store, um, you know, even Barnes and Noble, and there's oftentimes a, a New Orleans or Louisiana section. 
I mean, there's no other city or, or state that, that, that has that. I, I find that amazing. Uh, I mean, we had a whole, you know, there was a whole room just dedicated to Louisiana music at, at, when Tower was still here. And uh, I, I, I think the opportunities are limitless right now. Well, you know, it's really interesting to me to hear you say that, and I'd like maybe some of the other panelists to chime in on this as well, because uh, guilty, I have thought over the years that actually the market for New Orleans music or Louisiana music was actually fairly limited because it's a roots, generally perceived to be a roots thing, even though we all know that it's a lot broader than that, um, that it's basically a niche audience and that it's always going to have a, a limited uh, ability to sell. But, I mean, Marion, you know, you just have... Uh, I mean, can you guys talk about how you perceive the size of, of uh, the market for this kind of music? And one thing I would add, too, is that even if you were to sort of um, limit it and call it a niche music, is, you know, a niche music is not a bad thing to be in times when um, uh, the record business and the entertainment business overall are going, are, are, you know, is in such transition. So that's not a bad place to be, especially when it's not just that Tower in New Orleans no longer exists, Tower Records no longer exists, period. Um, so when you have fewer bricks and mortar buildings, they obviously have fewer sections of anything because they're not there anymore. So, um, and, and I think it would be, unfortunately, um, completely uh, inaccurate if we were to say that all music isn't experiencing a shrinking right now. Um, but the niche musics overall remain somewhat stronger, and there are new ways of, of selling that music. Um, and of course, in terms of uh, New Orleans music, it, it's not just the breadth of the music itself that is significant and does extend often beyond the niche music um, designation, but then you have people who come along, whether it's the Nevilles at the height of their success, or Dr. John, or someone like Robert Plant and Alison Krauss doing a New Orleans tune or two on their record, but there are all sorts of ways in which new attention gets focused on New Orleans music, and then there are various ways, of course, of developing that and spreading it as people become more interested all over again. So everything does go through cycles, even though this is a very um, sort of um, transitional time at best. Now, Ben, um, when, when people think, let's talk about the Preservation Hall Band for a minute, because that's you know, probably the quintessential traditional New Orleans jazz band that's out there. And I'm sure that a lot of people, when they think of that band and they think of that style of music, they assume that when we're talking about what the audience is, what the demographic is, that we're talking about an older demographic that, that has fond memories of a bygone era. What's your experience in who the consumers are, particularly for that traditional sound? And then I'd also like to ask you a little bit about where some of the new forays where you're going. Our, our, our typical uh, audience member here in New Orleans is different than our audience member when, when the band is out on tour. Here we'll find a lot of casual uh, visitors to the city who have really no um, knowledge of, of New Orleans music, but have heard of Preservation Hall, and it's, it's become this, uh, this uh, destination for a lot of people. We'll come in, and, and it's amazing to me how many people this, this will be their first experience hearing live New Orleans jazz. And uh, for a lot of them, it's the only time they'll ever hear any, any form of jazz or acoustic music. We're really blessed in New Orleans. Uh, most people don't get to hear live music as much as we do in one week, any time of the year here. Um, I, I, you know, if it's not for a performing arts center, there's really not a, a weekly music scene anywhere. So when we pull into a, a city like, like uh, we've been we've been to Madison, and when we pull into Madison, I mean, you, we have to consider also the the performing arts audience, uh, a soft ticket audience as opposed to a hard ticket audience. And, and Preservation Hall is, 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 is extremely successful in the soft ticket arena. We're very palatable uh, to, to, uh, to performing arts venues uh, around, the, around the country. And we've been developing our, young, our younger audience. Uh, and it's about education and awareness and uh, spreading our message, our message that this isn't uh, a museum piece, but but it's something that can be experienced and needs to be experienced. So you're, you're finding a range of age from 
young people as well as old people and everywhere in between. I, and and that that's been a we, I have we have and it's it's been a concerted effort on our part to to branch out and to go after newer audiences. We we knew I, I, all you have to do is go to one second line in New Orleans and you see the the age the range the the range in age of, of of people that this music appeals to. I mean, you could be from you know a kid two years old up into people in their 80s, everybody's out there on the street participating in this event. So this music has wide appeal. It's a matter of, of, of introducing it and, and educating uh, an audience. Now, Mike, I'm, I'm, I want to ask you, as an agent, when you're selling your, your client bands to talent buyers, how much, I mean, some of your bands, the, be the better known ones, Beausoleil, Dirty Dozen, um, Again, they, they have Louisiana written all over them. Beausoleil represents the breadth of Cajun music and culture. Dirty Dozen is a representative of the whole brass band tradition of New Orleans. Trombone Shorty is a younger artist, um, not as well known, but is certainly making a lot of headway out there. Um, comes from a very deep New Orleans tradition, but is expanding it in his own way. It still has a reflection of, of Roots music, but it's got some rock, it's got a you know, youthful energy to it. Um, how much in your pitching, when you're out there, I'm, su I'm sure that there's a built-in audience for the more established artists, but when you're pitching Trombone Shorty, for example, how much do you play up the fact that he's from New Orleans? Um, it definitely is a big factor. Um, we talk about the fact that uh, Alan Toussaint and the Marsalises and everything have said this is the next big guy, the next legendary figure coming up from New Orleans. And that adds credibility and it's real, real quotes from these people. Um, and, you know, the, he's the fest itself and how much uh, local artists perform during the fest is a big factor here too. That they get the exposure, a lot of talent buyers who are passionate about the music. Um, you know, come down here and they're aware as well and the, and the word of mouth spreads from person to person or we can refer, you know, check with so-and-so, check with so-and-so that, uh, you know, being the next big thing from New Orleans is, is a, a very special thing. And it's, we talked about, uh, you know, how much New Orleans means and I guess it goes both ways and, and a niche thing. The niche, like Marion said, is it's a very good thing on one hand. On the other hand, uh, you still need more than that. You still need to have individual awareness. Um, unless you're in a, you know, in a package situation, uh, again, like the Ponderosa Stomp, where you're, you're selling New Orleans in that case, or you're selling the, the whole overall theme. But most of the time, you're having to deal with an individual uh, artist and why a talent buyer should choose to book them as opposed to all the other options they have. So um, one thing that's exciting, somebody like a trombone shorty, people in the music business, there's always, everybody shares the excitement of, being in on something new, knowing something that you can turn other people on to, and then being part of watching it build and grow. And I think that's exciting for everybody in the business. And that's where Trombone Shorty can come in with an advantage as well. He's also uh, something that happens with a lot of artists, regardless of genre. Um, when you're younger and you've got lower costs and you haven't you know, decided we must all have this level uh, hotels and we must all have our own roadie or something like that you know at the very beginning it's easier to get around all over the world and I, I personally am big on trying to get everywhere in the world possible at that stage I've worked with artists who build up in one continent or another and then they've got offers to go to Australia but they can no longer afford to do it given their their new higher uh, costs on a weekly basis or something but if you start establishing everywhere you can as early as possible in Japan and Australia and Europe and so on and so forth, and you can build simultaneously worldwide. It's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but it can be done much more easily when the touring costs are cheaper. And so there's, again, an advantage for trombone shorty. All right. I want to open it up for questions, but before I do, I just want to talk briefly about um, the whole aspect of traditional versus non-traditional, because obviously there is a built-in appeal when you're pitching music from Louisiana that you can say represents a certain aspect of the tradition, whether it's a young Zydeco band or a jazz band or a brass band or a, or a Cajun or some, something that ties into the roots aspect of the culture because that is what is most famous. But a lot of folks are also aware that there's a lot of other music that is produced down here. In your worlds, because you're all dealing at a high level professionally, um, the fact that uh, an artist may be a rap artist or an R&B singer 
or um, a rock and roll band or is playing another, that we have a lot, there's this whole Ninth Ward alternative scene with am, ambient and ethereal and electronic and other kinds of music that's being produced here. I don't know whether you all have had any direct experience with any of those artists, but do you see a, I guess the easiest way to put it is, a benefit to those artists who are dealing in non-traditional styles, but still live here and are a part of the scene here, to the extent that they can attach themselves to the brand of New Orleans or Louisiana, do, would, does that, do you think that impacts the way they're, they're perceived in the marketplace? You're all looking at me quizzically like no, I have I, no idea what you're talking about. I'll be happy to jump in because uh, I do think that in fact it's more difficult for an artist like that unless it has something go, uh, to identify it or stamp it as coming from something that people are already um, familiar. And the other thing is that when you start getting into alternative or ambient or rap or whatever, there's a whole other le level of marketing, um, developing an artist that makes it, in fact, more difficult for a record company until the artist has already achieved a great deal of laying the groundwork that in the past record companies used to be able to afford to do that they can no longer do. So in fact, if you have an artist that's coming from those other supposedly more commercial backgrounds, if they break through, it is in fact more difficult to develop them now. So having a New Orleans association cannot, I mean, would definitely help. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, my and answer. I have to add too that um, with Trombone Shorty, for instance, um, when I work with the outdoor event, we have an Isthmus Jazz Festival on the lakefront on the campus at the big Union Theater. Um, and when they came to me and said, what kind of music, you know, would you recommend for outdoors this year, you know, I, of course, jumped on the idea of having trombone shorty. And um, it, was, it was a matter of having to bring my offbeat magazine to the meeting to show them, you know, a you know, description of them and then get as much as I could from them as fast as I could for the decision making. And he came, he blew the place away, he played outside, it was a beautiful night in June. Um, people were talking about him for, you know, but if he, now he's back again this year. And so he'll be back and everybody knows him and everybody's waiting for it and it's going to be a ticketed show. So I, I'm not sure if it's a ticketed show. I take that back, but it probably, yeah, I can't remember anymore. <laughs> but it, again, he's back and there's no educating anymore. There's no convincing anybody. It's like, you know, he, it's for, so for us with the, with, as Ben said, as a college town, you know, you've got those 70 plus thousand students and you get them convinced, and uh, you know that that level of the, the the person that maybe is just playing a niche here in Louisiana could easily do a good job up there for us too, because you know once we get that excitement, it doesn't really matter. Right, Ben, do you want to address any of the non-traditional stuff? I mean, you work with Clint Majin um, yeah. from. The I, well, I, I think it's an. It's important that, that artists who live here are, and are influenced by the music here and have roots here and are involved in the music scene here wear that as a badge of honor. It's, um, it's also easy to get categorized if you are Quintron and you say you're from New Orleans, you know, that you're going to show up and be playing uh, you know, second line music and anybody who's seen Quintron know that that's far from the truth. So there, there is, there, there is difficulty. I, I think it is something that, that I wouldn't market myself as a New Orleans act if I was Quintron, but I would definitely wear it as a badge of honor coming from New Orleans and being involved um, in, in the music scene here. Yeah. Well, I've, I've always tried to emphasize that regardless of the style of music that they're playing, hopefully one of the things that rubs off on artists, irrespective of genre, is when you're coming from a place like this, it's that authenticity that is a part of it. So whether you're playing hard rock or rap or, or jazz or what have you, there's an authenticity factor that you can tap into. And people associate our area with that. So regardless of what style you're playing, to the extent that you can utilize that public awareness or that, it, that impression that, that the world has about this authenticity factor. But, um, you know, just want to point to the example of Cupid, from, who is from Lafayette, but that is not really a part of his marketing. Um, people don't really talk about the fact that he's a Lafayette artist. That, I think, is just a great example of just somebody who, simply and truly, he just had the goods. He just had a great, 
great sound that was completely addictive. And it's no wonder that they were very quickly able to do a deal with Atlantic Records and have this huge club hit and uh, massive radio play. I mean, he's, a, you know, he's not a local artist anymore by any stretch. Um, and he's playing a jazz fest today, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I'll be there, because I just love that song. But, um, so uh, he could play that song for 40 minutes straight and nothing else, and I would be happy. But, I like <laughs> and, I call and, it. and we certainly couldn't have said that about Don't Mess With My Tutu that you just had. So. so, all right, well. I call it, I call it the hip hop uh, <laughs> Macarena. <laughs> it is. Um, but I just think that's, a, that's an example. So uh, for, for whatever style of music you play, if you are great and you can tap into some of that public perception of authenticity that, that surrounds us out there, I think that that's an advantage. So with that, I just want to, is there anybody that has any questions for our panel? Harris, Ray? Hey, Scott. Just an update for the panel and the audience. Uh, Power Records will be open again very shortly in a couple of weeks as Peaches Records, the venerable... Uh, New Orleans retailer will, will take over this, this lease the site. Congratulations. In a couple of weeks, and of course, Louisiana Red Hot will follow in a few weeks, which is from Bone Shorty's national label. Great. Yeah. Need those CDs, man. Very need those CDs. Need those CDs out of Bring them back, guys. Anybody have any questions for our panel? We have a very distinguished group of folks. Yes. Hi, my name is Jamal Betis. I am a New Orleans drummer and also a upcoming music producer. And I just released my solo CD, Jamal Betis, the unorthodox drummer, the first assembly. For those who probably say yes to the young brother, we said that. But it is true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no band, just you? Just yeah, like a band that's ran by the drummer. The drummer. Oh, so the dr oh, yeah. a, a drummer uh, as a band leader. I think there's, there's a lot of examples. Um, Herlin yeah. Riley. Shannon Powell. Oh, Shannon Powell. Okay, now what about as far as a younger drummer in the generation? Well, uh, Jason Marsalis, I think, is probably... The is probably, yeah, the... Uh, who's going out on his own with his own group. But it's still fairly new, unique, I would say. Yes. I represent Art Blakey. Tony yes. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I, I, I throw that out there because I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm up and coming. And, you know, my brothers, you know, yeah. my, my family, the Batches brothers, the Batches family, you know, a legendary musical family mm -hmm. here. Now, I'm just one of the next generations that's coming up. So I just wanted, you know, just to throw that to y'all attention, you know, to kind of, just to be on the lookout. Well, you know, the, so. the first thing that comes to mind right away for me is that, you know, Russell will be at our, in our venue this, in next March, in 09. So for, for me, just building with Russell there and getting an audience and getting, you know, people to know him, it would be pretty easy then to be able to come back and say, you, you saw PBS, you saw Russell, you know, we take a chance on you. Now, in saying that, for performing arts centers like ours, we also build on relationships. So for, for instance, you send me your materials, you tell me all about this, I go right away to the Union Theater and I talk to the folks there and I say, you guys need to do this in the summertime out on the, you know, at the union, you know, and get people excited about this guy. And then we'll probably be able to bring him back for, you know, the Capitol Theater or something like that. So relationships are important. Everybody on this table is very important to me because if they don't give me this, the tools I need to get you out there, right. it ain't going to happen. So, you know, it, you know, record people have to give me enough records to get them out to the stations. You know, the agent has to be very, you know, flexible and willing to do whatever. And the artist has to be very flexible and very uh, open to lots of different things. So. <laughs> but Jamal's a great example of an artist that is known here in town and is known for coming from a family with a really deep and strong tradition here, may not be very well known in Madison, Wisconsin. But, um, right. Okay, great.
how hard it is, no matter what level of success you've had, it's how hard it is. So clearly that statement indicates a passion to continue doing it. As the availability of hard product shrinks for record labels, and as fuel prices rise for touring bands, and as it becomes more difficult for mass audiences to know regionalized music for your kind of booking, how do you believe that touring itself is going to become more regionalized and more I'm not sure what, why you, how you get to the unlocalized there. Um, I don't see that as a problem at all. Actually. I don't see it as a problem. I just was wondering if you see less national tours and more regional tours. I, I, I will say, um, you know, as a record company, that I do see some of that happening, that there is more of a shrinking among touring artists, and it's partly the price of gas. I mean, I can't help but applaud completely what Mike said about having younger bands who can travel sort of mean and lean on the road and get them as far and wide as possible. But um, um, even bands that are sort of mid-level bands with the, the, the cost of gas doing even regional touring in some cases at really good paying jobs in secondary sized auditoriums are looking at tens of thousands of dollars more for just a region in gas costs alone. So I think that that is a problem and that sometimes means that people have to focus more on building up the region, getting established there, selling their CDs at gigs there, developing awareness there and building a base from that and then doing what they can to move out from that. I do think it takes longer sometimes these days because of the economy to um, get to where somebody might have gotten in a couple of years before. I don't see that as much actually. Just, uh, I see it's all about awareness again. And, all, and the really key word you brought up is passion. You know, And the passion is, is key in the artists. It makes a huge difference in their performance and, and tips the line from that's pretty good to I really want to book this artist. And passionate promoters here, like Mary Lou, who is really con concerned about New Orleans music and wanting to bring... Uh, it's, it makes all the difference in the world. But you've got passionate young artists, and gas, gas price is a problem, certainly, as far as traveling. But I, what we're seeing is, you know, the artists that we work with, at least, still can afford the gas, you know, and, and they'll go wherever they have to go and keep uh, moving with their career. I guess at a certain level... Yeah, 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 sure. And, uh, but, you know, if, if your costs are at such a tight level that there's just no, no flexibility anywhere, then I guess gas is going to be a concern. But I think once you've gone beyond that and if the passion is there, then uh, everybody we work with goes all over, you know, everywhere we can get them. And the, our job is to try to root really uh, carefully rooted tours so you're not driving 600 miles from one gig to another, but you're going 200 miles a day or whatever, or several days in a, in a region, so that uh, you've, got, you've got income every day. And income every day is sufficient to pay the bills and make money, as opposed to income here, and then days where you're spending money on hotels and travel and not playing that night. And, and certainly, you know, for, for my aspect, we go out of our way to do whatever it takes. Um, you know, I was told a long time ago not to uh, book the bands you love, you know, book the bands that other people love. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but unfortunately for the Louisiana music, I have to do it, and I, I pick the stuff that I love. And um, the thing is, you'd come, and we would do our best to hook you up with all our colleagues around the, you know, within the region, you know, Chicago, Milwaukee, um, you know, Minneapolis. It's all within a reach for you in one day, so it's so available, and we would make the calls. You know, I, I kind of feel like I become everybody's agents when, they, when I get the Louisiana bands up there because, you know, they need us. And... Uh, and we need to also call the other colleagues to let them know when you're coming and what's happening so that they can arrange it with them too. But that year in advance is so important. Um, I can't tell you, you know, if I call a band in Austin and I say, I want you um, next January, and they say to me, well, I don't even know what I'm doing next week. Well, I'm going to have to call somebody else because, you know, that ain't, that ain't going to work for me. So, the, so the, the six to eight months in advance is really, really, really important to me. And by the way, that's Paul Sanchez. Yes, I know. <laughs> John Oten, Rabidash Records.
and the, the check didn't come from me. We just put the stamp on it. I mean, yeah. we were we were just we were just we we, we just tried to made it happen. Um, we we actually always you know have I mean and it's it's changed somewhat over the years and it depends on of course the act and and you have to make some sort of projection of what you expect sales potential will be so obviously if it's you know a, a, a plant and Kraus record then it's it, it's obviously going to be very different because you know that you're going to be selling X number because you have the pre-orders to prove it. Um, aside from that, um, with developing artists, it's, you know, going to every place you possibly can to develop, you know, as our other panelists have been saying, the education. I mean, that's, that's critical and more important now than ever before. I was actually more talking about just the production, not the promotion. Well, again, that also has to be, to some degree, tied in with what you expect something is going to be able to sell. Fortunately, in some ways, with beginning artists, you can make really great quality records that sound good and that cost less these days. And that's a good thing because of the fact that things are so volatile right now. You know, I have to also say one little thing that uh, is a pet peeve for me um, is, you know, the electronic age is awesome. It's great when you tell me that your stuff is on your MySpace or your InFace or Facebook or whatever it is, right? Awesome. Great for you. No, it takes too much time for me. It means I gotta sit there and like look it up, and I gotta look at it, and I gotta sit there. I want to get that hard copy, and I want to be able to hand it to people. And and as much as there is the, the the age out there, it's great for you, and it's great to be able to hook up and just check you out for a minute. But if but if you want to promote yourself to me or to any of my colleagues, we need the hard copies and. Uh, you know, the media, our, our newspapers, for instance, are, they're, 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 their computers are so chaotic yet and so bad that if they say, well, just, I'll just, you know, send you my, my photo or I'll send you this. Well, some of these newspaper guys that I work with can't even open it up on their computer because they, you know, got a hundred-year-old computer on their desk. So, so those, are, those are the little weird glitches that always hang me up. So, sorry, Well, <laughs> uh, that's disappointing to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because one of the, as I talked about a little bit yesterday, we have a new initiative that's a part of the Sync Up project that is a website that we're, it's, that's called talent.jazzandheritage.org that we are building so that is specifically for talent buyers and for licensing of music. So, but it is online and it is very similar to a MySpace page. You, you, you see the link, you click on it, you, you listen to the music. You find out who the booking contact is or who the sync rights are owned by or the, or the master. So, and the other aspect of it is we have these little flash drives that we've made yeah. that have 118 songs on them by artists from all around the state that we give to talent buyers so, um, and, and music supervisors so that they can have a little sampler. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad to know that you're hip to the modern age. I'm disappointed to know that some of the people uh, that you work with uh, have yet to uh, figure out how to plug in their keyboards. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So my question does do with this whole technology yeah. aspect, but I think it's kind of the white elephant in the room because that's where you know, if you're talking about educating the newer generation, I mean, if those are the tools yeah. of marketing, that's the interface now. So my question is, you know, are you guys really using some of those tools? Like I was hearing um, when I was in Austin, like um, I, I believe it's last that then they've got a We do have folks in our marketing department for the last few years. No, 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 I mean, obviously we do, but I mean, uh, but who focus just on that these days. 
um, because of the fact that it is very essential and it's, it's a new way to, in fact, get more information about the people buying your records. So, yes, I mean, it's essential is the answer. And, and also, I, I think you need to realize that the, 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 the music industry is, is so many, there's so many different aspects of the music industry that, that there's, uh, that, that what, 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 what happens here with a talent buyer is, is, is a very, you know, it's a different process than someone who's, who's purchasing music online or someone who's doing marketing. Um, when, when you walk into a room, I mean, there's, and people still want to look at it. I think you want to experience something organic. Uh, that's why we still send out, we send out a virtual press kit, but we also have a, a physical press kit, which I much rather send out, and I, I, I much rather receive too. I much rather see an artist take the time to create something. I think uh, that to create something unique that's representative of who they are as an artist. And don't get me wrong, I'm not like a dinosaur here. It's just that you know, <laughs> I, I do check out the people's spaces. I do check it out. I listen. I do it all, but. But to actually have the physical pieces to be able to hand them to colleagues and to um, you know do things like that, it's really important. It's also and, and out, of, out of sight, out of mind. You hand exactly. them the CD, you hand the CD is there. It's but the if they've got a yeah. note of a uh, hundred yeah, different it's things it's to do on the computer, oh yeah, it's sitting on my desk. Yeah. You know, I keep looking at it. I, th I think you have to be yeah, you have to be comfortable in both both uh, you know. It's pretty easy to forget. See, I'm actually the, the opposite way because yeah. one of the things that we do here is we, we do all these other festivals and I yeah. find myself in the talent buyer role. And I'm looking only for local artists, so at least I've narrowed my focus that yeah. way. But it, it's, what's very important for me is that the artist has some internet presence because for the most part, that's how I check them out. I, it's especially if, let's say, we have a cancellation at an event and I need somebody to sub and that's got to be in the appropriate genre and I need to know now. It's like, okay, do they have a MySpace page? What do they sound like? Okay, great, you're great. Okay, here's the date, can you do it? Great, we're done. And for, 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 preferably via email. And the, the quicker they can reply to their email, the better it is for me. So it's just my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. I think you have to be in, in both areas. going to purchase music, I believe. I don't know what that form is going to be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's still, you know, despite the numbers being off in the record industry, overall 80% is still hard copy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank our panel for a really terrific morning. Thank you so much. Ben Jaffe with Preservation Hall, Mary Lou Kraus with the Overture Center for the Arts in Madison, Wisconsin, Mike Kappas from the Rosebud Agency, and Marion Leighton-Levy of Rounder Records.